Good morning, Life Community Church. We are so happy that you have joined us this morning. Whether you're here in-house for the service or you're at your house watching online, we are so happy um, that you are joining us for church this morning. Yeah, and if it's your first time here, we would love to get to know you. So by doing that, just text the word welcome to what number, Duncan? 618-232-4707. That's the best way that you can connect is by texting that number. And hey, we would love to see you at a new people gathering. So whether you've been coming here for four or five months, or you've been coming here for a week, but the greatest thing you can do is go to a new people gathering. It's the first Sunday of every month at 10 a.m. here at LCC in the multi-purpose room. Um, and we would love to see you there. What, what is the new gathering? Well, the new people gathering, you're going to hear from our pastors. You're going to hear where we came from. You're going to hear where we're going. So it's a great time to connect with our pastors and hear about the vision for Life Community Church. Yes, and if you haven't already, download the LCC app, which you can sign up for events, watch sermons that our pastor has preached, and the Bible's on it. Pretty much anything you need, anything it's you on need. the app. It's so make sure you download app. it. But the one thing you can't get on that app is these amazing t-shirts. Yes. Where can they get these t-shirts, Matea? At the, li the Shop Life. If you go to Shop Woo! Life here behind us after service, <laughs> Um, you can get these shirts for the whole family for $15 in a variety of colors. So cute. And there, last but certainly not least, there's four ways to give. They're on the screen. <laughs> on the screen. Enjoy the service. Yeah. Every chance. 
Echoing his eminence 
its inmost melody and every human heart its native cry and in one in a raptured hymn of praise we'd sing Christ be of this song, we're asking that you would be magnified, that our life would be an altar that you are seen from, that you are blessed by, that you are made known. God, when we think we understand it for ourselves, or maybe we've been taught something by tradition or a podcast or a person or someone we follow, God, when we think we've grasped something, I pray that truly our hearts and humility would be May you be magnified. We just want to know you, Jesus. We just want to make you known. We just want to know your heart for us, your heart for your children. 
It's not about us conjuring something up this morning. It's not about us going through the motions, but Lord, would you be magnified in this church and in our families? Jesus, we give you this time, we give you our attention, and we don't have it all figured out, but we wanna know you, we wanna see you, and humbly walk with you all the days of our lives. Jesus, we love you. We're gonna sing a song that you guys probably know really, really well, and one of the reasons this is one of my favorite songs is because it's just the gospel. If you don't know, you're about to learn a very basic, full version of the gospel, and we're gonna sing death could not hold you. You have no rival. There's so many trendy Christians out there teaching like, oh yes, yes to that too. Oh yes. And we believe in this house that there is no rival to Jesus. There is no other way. He is our alive, our risen, personal, present savior. And we're going to sing and declare that together this morning. We're going to believe every word of scripture that we're singing today. You were the word at the beginning, the one with God, the Lord. That's John 1.1 1, 1 we just sang. We believe this, your hidden glory in creation is now revealed. Could not hold you. Death could not hold you. 
name, there's no other name. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. And nothing can for the cross. We are thankful for your word. We remember you, Jesus. I pray that we would know you, that you would be magnified in this house this morning, that you would be magnified in the way we treat people, in the way we learn about you, the way we think, the way we walk. God, I pray that it would all be for and about you. We want to know you. We want to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, welcome. Good morning. We are so happy you guys are here with us. Right now, we're going to dismiss the fifth and sixth graders. Get on out of here. We have a special class for them. And then you guys go ahead and greet some pretty person next to you before you're seated. Right behind you, there's an actual billy club. It's like a tree in here, really. It's, he's at home. This is not his home. Don't break nothing. He's coming to you. Get something to feed him with. Before that moment, I would have said Tom Owen was one of our manliest men in this house. Oh, Tom. <laughs> hey, guys, if you, uh, man, if you have a video, in the next couple weeks, we're going to be displaying those. And I know some of you do because I, I've seen them on Facebook. And uh, I know you got some funny videos. Just send those to, to Caleb at lifeillinois.org. We love to display your family moments, and I might have a couple of them come in the next couple weeks uh, because I got a lot of kids a lot like my wife. You guys awake? You guys all right? Because she's in the room doesn't mean that you got to back away, all right? I know how it is. I know how it is. I know how it is. I'm a, I'm a different preacher when she's not here. I understand that too. I understand that too. Second service last weekend at Easter, it was a little different. She was in kids, you know what I mean? Oh, all right. Do we need to take a coffee break or everybody switching to decaf? All right. All right. Jesus, thank you for today. God, we give you praise and we give you honor. There is no other name but the name of Jesus. We stand on that promise. God, there are men and women in this room that can testify today of the goodness and the mercy of Jesus. God, their lives have been radically changed because of the gospel, not because of anything that we've done, but because of what you've done. 
And God, that's, that's who we are. We are who we are because of Jesus. And God, we just want to give you the praise that you are worthy of. And thank you. And God, we pray these next couple minutes as we unpack some things. First and foremost, Lord, I, I thank you that you love us. And I thank you because you love us. You, you speak things to us. You speak truth. You're not sugarcoating anything. You're, you're showing us the truth. And I pray that our eyes would see, our ears would hear. And God, give us a heart to follow after you in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, a couple passages of scripture that I just want to remind us of. Paul's talking to the Corinthian church, and he says this. He says, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. It's who I was just praying about. You know Jesus differently now than you once did. You used to just be a cuss word in some of your mouths, right? Oh, come on, somebody. I need you to wake up. I know how you used to be. I know how we all used to be. This means anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task. What's your task? What's your purpose of reconciling people to him? For God was in Christ. Reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. First John tells us in a couple verses, and you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. A couple verses later, he says, But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who's been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of Man, Son of God, came to destroy the works of the devil. Like, listen, before we get into family conversations, before we get into what it is to be in family, we have to understand and be reminded of why Jesus came. Jesus came so that you and I could walk in freedom. And it doesn't matter how we used to be. It doesn't matter where we used to be. It doesn't matter how we used to talk. That's part of our old story. Why? Because he says we're a new creation. He says and it's not just that we're a new creation. We have a task. Our task is that we're reconciling people to the Father, not to us, not to a building, not to this church. Our goal isn't to get people to, to be members or, or family at Life Community Church. That's not the goal. The goal is to get people to follow Jesus. Paul ultimately said, follow me as I follow Christ. We've, we've, we've listened to the first part of that. Primarily pastors. We've taken this message of follow me, but we've forgotten the follow Christ part. Like, no, it's not follow me. I'm going to wrong you. I'm going to mess you up. There are going to be things that, that I do that you're not going to be proud of. Follow me as I follow Christ. Why? Because when I'm in Christ, when I'm following Jesus, this is good. When I'm following Jesus, I'm a different person, which is why that has to be the first and foremost thing. How is me and Jesus? That should always be the question. Are we good? Are we doing good? Why? Because everything in my relationship with Jesus flows from that. How I am as a man, how I am as a friend, how I am as a husband, how I am as a father, how I am as a coach, how I am as a pastor. All of these things flow from my relationship with Jesus. So when people come in and say like, oh yeah, me and Jesus, has been a while. Well, he hasn't moved, so what, what's going on? Well, I'm a little mad at him right now. Okay, let's talk about why you're mad at Jesus. Let's talk about this hurt. Let's talk about all of these things. But we don't do that. We band-aid it. We, we push it to the, to the side and we, we think we're fixing something, but the reality is we're making it worse. We're making it worse. So we have to start this next four weeks talking about why Jesus came. Not just family issues. Everybody in this room has family issues. I think the work of the enemy was Jesus came to destroy. Did you hear that part? The work of the enemy is to think that your family is the only weird family. We're all part of weird families. Some of you shout a little louder. I get that. <laughs> Do you remember the story of Zacchaeus? I remember it because he was a wee little man, and I like to hang out with a wee little man because I feel better about myself. 
you know? Hayes knows what I'm talking about. And uh, it's all right, buddy. There's still hope. You're only 17. You're going to still grow. One day, one day you'll be as tall as Duncan. Anyway, Zacchaeus, probably not. But Zacchaeus, but you scored a lot more goals than Duncan. Is Duncan in here? Duncan has scored one goal in his high school career. (laughs) One goal. And he'll let you know it. You walk up to him right now and say, Duncan, what goal did you score? It was against (laughs) Valmeyer. I don't even think it was the game winner because it was 17 to nothing. But I don't think it was the game winner. (laughs) Was it the first goal? Well, whatever. Okay, so anyway, you've scored more goals than him, buddy, so it's okay. It's all right. (laughs) <laughs> but Zacchaeus, he's a little guy, right? And the Bible says that Jesus came to Zacchaeus. And the Bible says that he, he calls him. He's a tax collector. He, he comes into the crowd, all these things. But do you remember what he declared about Zacchaeus? In Luke 19, he said this. Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Like we understand the seeking to save part. But when you put it into the context of who Jesus just saved, it blows your mind. Because Jesus came not just to reconcile, not just to forgive, but to change generations of people. He didn't just change you so that you could put it as a status on your social media. He didn't just change you so you could tell a couple people. He changed you. He transformed you so it will change generations after you. It will outlive you. It will be your story. It will be your family's legacy. That's why he changed you. That we're always pointing people back. And I bring up Zacchaeus because we could have talked about a lot of people Okay, but he saved a tax collector and a cultural times, a tax collector was the worst of the worst. Okay, it was like working for the government. That's what he did. Okay, don't don't get mad at me if you work for the government. That's who he saved. Matthew is also included in that. And because he did that, we can see the stories and say, this household was changed Because Zacchaeus was changed. He changes families. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you have two families. You have the family that God gave you. That's the first and foremost. And you have this church family. And there are characteristics of both. You might have a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad that you did not choose. And the same could be true of this place. As you look around here. And you see people that maybe you've done business with. People that maybe you've done life with. People that you're like, I cannot believe they're here. Can we say that? Because there are people all the time that tell me, like, do you know that so-and-so is there? I'm like, yeah, that's a good thing. I know, but do you know what they've done? I said, listen, and I've used this to you guys before. I don't understand why this blows our minds that sinning people come to church. Like, where else do you want them to go? Like, you have no problem when fat people go to gyms. <laughs> Nobody has a problem with that. Like, yep, yep, they, that's good. They need to be there. Yep, that's great. Nobody skinny is walking into Nutrisystem saying, you know what, I want to try this diet. <laughs> Too much? <laughs> like, I mean, we don't do that with anything. We don't go to GNC. We don't go, like, I'm not walking to Home Depot looking for a Target shirt. Because they're going to look at me like I'm stupid. Why in the world are we so blown away when people that have reputations and are sinners come to church, we're like, can you believe they're here? Yes, I can. Because that is the goal. We want them to be here. (laughs) It's like Jesus came to find the healthy. No, he came to find the sick. That's why we meet. That's why we gather. And listen, you know what Paul would say? Guys, I'm the worst of the worst. And I'm your father. I'm your leader. I'm the worst of the worst. Why? Because he recognized, man, we're all lost in need of a savior. This is what family looks like. 
Paul told the Ephesian church, he came and he preached peace to, to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. You know who he's talking to? He's talking to Jews and Gentiles. Because there was a mindset that Jews could not believe that somebody wasn't a Jew could find Jesus. Listen, before we start, before we start thinking we're different, we do the exact same thing. What, what, what church were you raised in? The St. Louis thing, right? What church, what high school did you go to? What church were you raised in? Oh, okay, okay. He's, he's doing the same thing. Listen, it's one spirit, Jew and Gentile. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. And also, here it is, members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. Say, listen, it's not just that you have brothers and sisters, unless you're me. I don't have brothers. I only have women in my life, and that was in the form of two sisters. I'll never forget the day that I found out that um, maybe it's a family history or story I shouldn't tell, but I'm, I'm going to anyway. Uh, sorry, Mom and Dad, if I'm not supposed to. But I found out that my dad also had a child in, in high school, and I didn't find out later in life. And, and so there's like this glimmer of hope, right? Oh, do I have a brother? He's like, no, it was a girl. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, <laughs> I thought this was going to be a great Hallmark ending, you know what I mean? Like the snow starts falling. We run to each other. Brother, you know, but no, 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 that's, that's not true. That's not true. You don't get to pick. You don't get to pick here. You have brothers and sisters all around you. Brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is the family that God's talking about. On, on Wednesday, the first Wednesday of the month, uh, me and Pastor Sean take the juniors and seniors. Um, and we, we've been doing this a couple times where we take juniors and seniors. And we just do some leadership stuff. They're about to enter into what I deem is one of the most difficult times of, of a person's life. Transitioning from high school into what we would deem the real world, you know, from a cultural standpoint. We don't know what adulting is. Let's, let's be real. I mean, we, the ages. Anyway, that's all another sermon. Uh, and so we take the junior senior. We do our best to prepare them for what's about to come, all the things that's happening. And then the sixth grade to tenth grade stay here. And obviously we're getting into this family series also with students. And so they're asked, these 6th sixth, uh, sixth to 10th graders were asked a couple questions. And I want to share some of these uh, answers with you. Uh, there was 76 6th uh, to 10th graders that were there. And uh, this was the first question. Do you have regular time that you and your parents talk about your life and relationships? 35% said yes. 47% said no. 16% said sometimes. If you're hurting emotionally or need to talk about something personal, who do you go to? 39% of them went to mom, 12% went to dad, 24% went to neither. A, couple, a smaller percentage said myself, some said friends, and one said great grandma. Describe your family using one word. I'll start with the good news. 38 of them said welcoming, loving, caring. 38 of the 76. The other words were fighting, broken, there, dream crushers. Traumatized, crazy, wild, chaotic. What's one thing you wish your family did that you see other families doing? Okay, so for us parents in the room that think our kids don't, aren't observing, right? Here's what they're observing. That I lived with my mom permanently. Wish my dad and sister went to church with me and my, and my mom to be more supportive and help me with my problems. Communicate without raising our voices and getting mad. We, one, one other thing that I would love to see my family do that I see other families do, praising the Lord together, act normal, 
love each other or not divorce, go to church together, see my parents together and not fighting, get along and spend time together, have homemade dinners and eat together as family, stay together, go on vacations and have real family time. I wish my parents were still together so we could do holidays as a big family again, eat dinner every night as a family, express my feelings. Okay, that's some of the students that were here on Wednesday night, the things that they've said about family or they're observing about family. And I I bring those up only to say, can we agree that family is messy? Can we agree that all of us in this room don't have it all together? Can we agree that last Easter we saw some of those family? And we've realized even more we don't have it all together. Come on, somebody. It's not just Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter, right? We've realized this. And because we've realized this, we've come to an understanding that there is still hope. We come to an understanding because we've been transformed by the good news that is Jesus. And because we've been transformed... We are to live different. And this is the hope that no matter where you're from, what you've done, there is still an opportunity to change. There's still an opportunity to fix some things. Because this is the reality. God has called us to live this thing out in the form of relationships. Doing life with one another. Using things like the fruit of the Spirit. You know, the early church in Acts 2 is a great picture, 42 to 44, a great picture of how the church was. And the goal, really, the Bible says they worshipped together in the temple. The Bible said then they left there and they shared a meal together. They worshipped together in homes. They, They had communion together. The Bible says they daily did devotions and prayed together. They were in small groups and all of these things. It's this beautiful picture, which is why years ago when when the church kind of went on this this small group tangent, which was an incredible thing, like let's go smaller, let's do small group. We we took this mindset of like let's go all small group. And it was like, well, wait a second, there's a benefit of both. And the other church went like, no, we're only big. We're doing Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're coming together and your kids are going to be here and love it. And it's like, oh, my gosh, we've serviced people to death. I mean, I remember being in Bible college. I was in church ten times in a week. It's like, yes, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, like ten chapel misses, you know what I mean? It's like, hey, dude, I need you to miss today and go sit in my seat so that I'm already at ten. Okay, so I need, I need some help. We just service people to death. And so those people are like, yes, small group. It's a balance. There's got to be both. And Acts 2 is clear. Like this is the church. This is, this is doing life together. This is what it's all about. Sharing, doing life, hard things, tough things, difficult things. We don't avoid those things. Like the heart of, of the church isn't to avoid hard things. The heart of the church has to be reconciling those things. We don't avoid hard things. We don't sweep them under rugs. We don't not talk about them. We do them so that the heart of reconciliation, what I read to you in the beginning, this is the heart of God, to reconcile people to the heart of the Father. And I've given you this task. You know why it's a task? Because we're dealing with people. All of us in this room are a task. And the message of reconciliation is so much more difficult. I would rather avoid you and your feelings and all the feelings that come with it than to actually open that Pandora's box. So we're going to avoid it. and We're not going to talk about it. And then you're going to have students that go, man, I would love to just sit around a dinner table and talk about the things that are bothering me. Why? Because 15-year-olds that hold things in become 45-year-olds that hold things in. Because in culture we say, if you just do this, you'll arrive. Just graduate. Just go to college. Just get this job. Just marry this person. And all the while, we think we've arrived at all these points, and we've not arrived. We've just carried more stuff into it. And then we're like looking at ourselves in the mirror at 50 years old going, what did I miss? I missed it. 
We didn't talk about it. We didn't do life together. So let's, let's listen, look at what some of the Bible talks about when it comes to family. First and foremost, John continues in 1 John 3. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that, that is, that is what we are. He says, listen, you are a child of God. You are a son. You are a daughter. That, that language is is important for us to understand. Because if you don't see yourself as a child of God, if you don't see yourself as a son or daughter, you will operate differently. When you understand sonship, when you understand being a child of God, when you understand who God calls you to be, that language matters. You live different. You respond different. You act different. He says, not just that, we're family of believers. Paul told the Galatian church, as we have have this opportunity, let's do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of God. He says, listen, we do good to all people everywhere we go. But hey, listen, the family of God, this has got to be different. This is a given. This is a given that we do life together. This is not a question mark. Know this, and I've said this a hundred times to us, but I also know, man, there is something happening in culture with every generation. It'd be easy to be like, those 18 and unders, their attention span is just, I think all of our attention spans. I was reading a study on like my generation. The attention span was seven to nine minutes, which I don't think is true. When I say the new generation, the attention span is seven to nine seconds. And they're trying to blame social media, TikTok, because this is what we do. That was funny. Oh, that one's funny. I mean, you get an email with two paragraphs, you delete it. You're like, I don't even know what it says, but too long. Too long. We have more books being read to us than we've ever read. We listen to more podcasts than we do anything else. Why? Because I can do other things. We're multitasking. And some might say, wow, that's really smart. I would say we're losing our attention span. So then when it comes to doing good, when it comes to doing what God's asked us to do as sons and daughters, and we lose interest, and we move on, and we do all these things, this gets really difficult doing life with one another. Right? So he uses this. He uses the phrases, we're all in this together. He told the Corinthian church, if one part suffers, we all suffer. If one rejoices, we all rejoice. See, in the family of God, if I can't celebrate when people win, I'll never have compassion when they lose. When someone wins in the family, you find out real quickly, real quickly, where you are. I'll give you an example in our own family. Libby might have the nicest car in our family. I didn't know how my boys were going to respond to this. Okay? We gave Libby this car. She's paying for college. There's a lot of things. We gave her this car. And my boys were ecstatic. I couldn't believe it. Lila pumped that Libby got this car. Libby, she just cries. That's just She just does that naturally anyway. She just... She can make herself cry. She should be in the drama department. I mean, she's a female. She's already in that department. I'm just kidding. I'm just. You know what I'm saying, though. Guys, I know some of you are afraid to say yes right now, right? You know what I'm saying. Give me the little nod. <laughs> some bold ones here. Yep. Chris, you, you went quiet on me, Chris. All right, brother. All right. <laughs> In that moment as a family, I was, I was, what struck me the most was how my other kids responded. It was a revealer to me as a father. And I was happy with it. It doesn't always happen that way. Why? Because in the family of God, we have to celebrate when people win. And if I can't celebrate with people win, it's revealing an inadequacy, an insecurity, a jealousy thing that's going on inside of me. So why in the world 
would I think that I would have compassion on that believer when they fail? Paul told the Corinthian church, because you're part of the family of God, when they suffer, you suffer. When they rejoice, you rejoice. The greatest litmus test for us as a church is how are we doing with people when they're mourning and when they're rejoicing? I think it's a great test for us. Why? Because we are all in this thing together. Deuteronomy 6 says it this way. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. I love that language. Jesus would repeat this later in Matthew 22. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord God of your ancestors promised you. Listen, O Israel, second time. Listen, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. He says, listen, this is the reminder as family of God, as family, as men and women who are parents in this room or grandparents or you're single in this room and that's a desire of you. No matter where you're at, you're in a family somewhere. As family, be reminded of what the Lord your God has said. Be reminded of this list that God has called us to do and to be. Godly parents, consistent parents, good listeners, disciplining without rejection, disciplining without anger. Like parents who are loving one another. The greatest thing that I can do for my kids is to love their mom. It is. It's what I want them to see. We will kiss and the twins still go, oh. It's the cutest thing, which, which is awesome that they respond that way because it allows us to kiss more. <laughs> right? It's like if they're saying, gross, disgusting, like, oh, no, no, don't take that away. You know what I'm saying? Admitting failure, praying together, reading the word together, being in church together, all of these things. We're teaching our children, discouraging criticism in the family, encouraging feelings, encouraging things to, to, to be unloaded, like encouraging all these things. This is what the writer in Deuteronomy, this is what he's saying. Like these are the things that we're supposed to be known for. Being willing to forgive, being willing to talk, being honest with your kids. All of these things that I don't have time to really t go into. He's saying all of these things, write them down. Put them on your doorpost. Hang them on your mirror. Put them anywhere that you can. So what? So your kids know what we believe, who we are, what this family stands on. Because there's no doubt they're going to go into another home. And they're going to go, that's, that's, not how we, that's not how we do things at our house. There's no doubt, as I even mentioned in the beginning, you're going to be aliens and strangers in this world. There's going to be things. It's not when in Rome, act like Rome. There's no moment that Jesus sat down with sinners and said, let me partake in what you're doing so that I can win you. There's no moment like that. We try to say that as if we can act like crazies all in the name of the gospel. That's not what he said, nor is it what he did. And actually, when he met with them, they actually changed. Well, I'm still like building a relationship with this guy for five years now. At what point are we going to actually share the gospel? Like, it's just a pet peeve of mine. Listen, listen, don't, don't get mad at me. I'm talking to family right now, Okay. Don't get mad. But if you're inviting someone to church and they don't know your story before they come here, we've done them a disservice. You've invited them to a church, not a relationship. And then don't get mad if we didn't sing the song that you wanted us to sing to keep your friend here. Yeah, an actual email, FYI. 
Or I wouldn't have minded if you would have spoken on this. Well, guess what? You didn't rub me three times and you don't get a wish, okay? That was a little weird, but all right. <laughs> uh, things you don't say in second service, all right. <laughs> I have a feeling a lot of people are going to walk up and just, <laughs> <I'm> just <laughs> oh, Jesus repeating Deuteronomy 6 and Matthew 22, because the Pharisees had come to him to trick him, first and foremost, to trick him in, in what they believed. Keep in mind the religious leaders, they knew the Torah. There's two groups of people, primarily the Sadducees and the Pharisees that were these religious leaders. The Sadducees only read the Torah. They believed only in the Torah. They did not believe in the afterlife, which is why they always questioned Jesus on the afterlife. The Pharisees, they were a little different. They were experts in the law. The Bible says they loved to debate it. There are 613 laws, most of which were man-made, and they knew every single one of them. And so every time they ask Jesus these questions... It's to trick him. So when they said to him, what's the greatest commandment? Like, what, what is it? Like, what do we hang this on? Jesus goes back to the word, Deuteronomy 6, and says, oh, okay. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. This is what he went back to. What are we to do as family first and foremost? Love Jesus. Amen. First and foremost. Why? Because everything flows from that relationship. And so then why wouldn't that be the main thing that we're about? We too ask those questions. Like, what is the thing that I should be doing? Should I be reading this? Should I be having this devotion line? Should I, all of those come under this guise of loving Jesus. And there's a lot of things under that. But that is the first thing. Matthew 6, Like, above all else, seek first the kingdom of God. First and foremost, this is what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be loving Jesus. What can you do as a husband to better love your wife? Love Jesus first. What can you do as a father? Love Jesus first. What can you do as a boss, as an employee, as a college student, as a high school student? In order to love other people well, you have to love Jesus first. It's first and foremost. And listen to me. This is where we're getting confused in culture, and this is what Jesus addresses with, the, with these Pharisee religious leaders. Because, because there was confusion on loving God and loving Jesus. Meet other people that follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob but have a problem with Jesus. Think about this. What was Jesus addressing to the Pharisee religious leaders? You say you love God, but you don't love me. The love of the Father is not in you then if you don't love me. See, we don't say love God, serve people. We say love Jesus so that there's clarity on the one that we serve. Because when I say love God, I, I, could, I could be really inclusive to all my Muslim, Jehovah Witness, all these people. Like, we have the same God, yes, but what do you do with Jesus? That's the difference. That's the difference. And it's a trick. It's a trick to bring people in under this understanding, Jesus said to these people, I know you don't have the love of God in you. He says, listen, I know you don't have the love of God. In I have come in my Father's name and you didn't receive me. What's he addressing? He's addressing this, this mindset that we have all in an attempt This attempt to reach people 
that we leave Jesus out. And this is what the religious leaders were doing. So they said to him, so what do you say is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and the greatest. He says, you can't, you can't even do that. You can't do that. He says, he says later to him, you're following your father, which is the devil. I mean, that's what he said to him. Like, try that next time. That's what Jesus said to him. Why? Because Jesus was saying, listen, when you love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, then everything else in your life will figure itself out. So much that he even said later in Matthew, he said, listen, I need you to love me more than you love your kids, more than you love your wife, more than you love your mommy and your daddy. You have to love more than that. It was a call. It was a call. And John said it this way. We love each other because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. He says, listen, it's, it's quite easy. It's quite simple. And, and he's, Paul told the Corinthian church, if anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Listen, listen to what I'm saying to us as family today. Listen to what I'm saying. There are things that are happening in your life that are chaotic. And first and foremost, know that the Lord is redemptive in nature. It's why he came, to reconcile your heart to the heart of the Father. And we all know that we have messed up situations that we bring to the situation, right? And we did them. We did them. We're not blaming God. We're the ones that did them. Our selfish desires, all of these things, like we're the ones that did it. We put our, our foot in our mouth. We did all these things. We're the ones that did it, right? We see the results of not loving Jesus and loving ourselves more, loving our job more, loving all the, we see the results of all these things. We can agree on that, right? When I'm loving Jesus, things seem to be a little better. When I'm not, man, things are a little messed up, right? We see the difference. Okay, that's not to say to you that if you love Jesus, everything is perfect. Wow, who's little Johnny? Man, this kid is incredible. All because I'm loving Jesus. All because I had devotions today. Johnny's the best kid in the world. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying your perspective is different because you love Jesus. The order is different. Your priority is different. When someone comes to you in your family and says, I don't know what I'm going to do with this, let's, let's, let's go to Jesus first. Let's see what he wants. I'm not going to give you my wisdom. Let's ask for his wisdom. So when Paul tells the Corinthian church, if anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. What is he saying? He's telling the Corinthian church, listen, when, you're, when your priorities are out of whack, chaos is sure to follow. It will get crazy. And the craziest part is not what happens to you, it's what happens in you. Because what happens in you is you start trying to figure it out on your own. And before long, you become God. And before long, all of the things that we should have dealt with are now under here. Let's let them live there. They'll be okay there. We don't have to talk about them there. And what flows then from the generations to come, the family to come? What, what flows? Craziness. Some might call it curses. Some might call it curses. I understand. I get why we avoid hard things. Because they're hard. I get every single one of us in this room, man, we, we seek an easier, simple, comfortable life. We want that. We desire that. We spend lots of money on a mattress for that. Come on. Not everybody got that. 
that one on Amazon, right? <laughs> Why? Because we desire it, right? But what happens when comforts and difficulty collide? Do we deal with the hard things or do we just hope that they go away? Knowing that the scheme and the works that, the, that Jesus defeated, the scheme and the work of the enemy at that moment is the hope that you would think it goes away. It doesn't go away. It just comes out later. And listen to me. Listen to me. It may not come out later in your generation, but it could in the one after you. I tell people all the time, you can handle some of the things that you're dealing with. Your kids cannot. Your kids may not. You may not be an addict in that area, but, but your kids watching you do it, they could be an addict in it. And listen, there's not a parent in this room. There's not a parent in this room that would wish or hope that any of your kids would become an addict in something. None of us. We wouldn't wish that on our kids. And so what he's saying is how do we want them to be from here on out? This is the family of God. And the family of God, and we're going to talk about this the next couple of weeks. I know I warned some of you and some of you are like, yep, I'm going on vacation. We have to talk about hard things so that, not to bring them up to say like, oh, you went through hard things. Let's talk about them. Let's get you to cry. Let's get you all these emotions out. No to reconcile you to the heart of the Father. To reconcile this task that he's given us. To reconcile. Why? Because we don't want to be known in this community as a people that love God and hate the people that we do life with. I don't want you avoiding small groups because you can't stand her. Maybe what he's saying is you should probably deal with that. Maybe we should deal with that. And listen to me, before, I know some of you, you're thinking this. You, you used to think that I, just, that I just looked at you. Now I'm going to tell you what you're thinking. <laughs> some of you are thinking, I'm not wired that way. I don't have the personality of confrontation. That's just not who I am. I know. You've believed that lie your whole life. The lie is that you shouldn't deal with it. And you know what Jesus said? What he said to the religious leaders? You've just showed me who your father is. He said some hard things to those religious people. Things that would not grow churches today. Ultimately what he's saying is, guys, I want to fix this. They wanted nothing to do with Jesus. Okay? Would you stand with me right now? Prayer partners, would you... Jump in. Jesus, we know that first and foremost, family was your idea, not ours. And here's how I know family was your idea. First and foremost, your word says it, and I've seen how the devil has fought the family. So I know, I know we're contending right now with family. We're contending right now with how family should look. Our culture is definitely dealing with a lot of things on what family should look like. And I know in this room, even what family looks like in our lives, it's not how we thought it was going to be. It's not what we thought, but yet we're still breathing here. We're still here, and you still have a plan, and you want to use us to reconcile those situations. This might lead to family conversations. This might lead to family dinner. This might lead to a family moment where we got to talk about some hard things. Maybe it's an admission of guilt. Maybe it's asking for forgiveness. Maybe it's going to another brother or sister in this room. Maybe because of dealings that have happened outside of this room, we have to have a conversation. Maybe the conversation starts with, hey, if we're going to go to the same church together, then. 
And God, our admission today is that we're willing to walk through hard things so reconciliation happens because that's why you came. It would be a slap in the face, the church, the vehicle, the system that you put in place for the gospel to get out. It would be a slap in the face to say we're more about this than we are seeking those who are lost. Reconciling people to the heart of the Father. It would be wrong of us to be about that. So God, would you give us wisdom? Because we, we don't know how to do this on our own. On our own, it's just our idea. But with you, it brings life. With you, it brings restoration. And God, we're asking for your help. We need you. We need you. In the name of Jesus. If you're in this room right now and you need someone to pray with you, our prayer partners are available. But there's a declaration in this song we're about to sing. So I encourage you to just hang tight for a couple more minutes. And it's this declaration. It's in your freedom, I will live. It is you saying, I will. I mean, David said this, I will bless the Lord. Like some of you, you need to speak to your emotions right now. I will seek reconciliation. I will walk in freedom. You've been walking in bondage for years. Unwilling, unwilling to say hard things. Unwilling to admit wrongs. Unwilling to crush pride. I will. Live in your freedom. I will step into your promises. I am a daughter of the King. I am a son of the King. I am a part of the body of Christ. And I will live different because of what Jesus has done, not because of what I've done. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, church. Search for you, God of strength. Bow to you in my brokenness. And no other king could have so hard. No. Oh. 
Lord, you open me. There is nothing else that's so. to what I know. Every single one of you, the Lord desires that you live in freedom. Freedom that He's created. He's done all the work through His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you're visiting with us for the first time, we are so glad that you're here and we want you to walk in that freedom. And it's simple. It's easy. Piece of cake. It's what you heard today. It's what you heard last week. 
It's receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's your first step. That's your next step is to receive him, to repent, right? Listen, I'm done living my own way. It's causing me no freedom. Man, but what I've heard here today, I want to live in that freedom. And it's really easy, really simple. It's just saying to the Lord, I'm done living for myself. I repent. I want to start living your way. I want to start walking with you. And we would love to connect with you. And for the easiest way for us to do that is for you to grab your phone, right, uh, and text the word welcome to the number on the screen. If you're ready to take the next step in walking with Jesus, this will give us an opportunity to follow up with you. Or even if you're here for the first time, you've never been here, and you're like, I would just love to have more information about the church, uh, you're in luck. Not only can you text the word welcome and we'll respond and get with you, but today is our new people gathering in between services right after this service in the multi-purpose room. You can come join us as Pastor Jamie and Kelly just kind of talk about how we got here, where we're going, all these kind of things. Hey, this week, if you're looking for some fun, a really good time with your faith family, or if you're new and you're like, I want to spend some more time with my faith family. We have a concert that's going to be here Wednesday night, Unspoken, the Unreal Tour. It's going to be a really good time. You go on the LCC app and you can get tickets for that. We'll be selling tickets that night, all those kind of things. So come ready to have a great time. If your family here today, this is where the work begins. If this is your house, I need you to do something. I need, to get your, I need you to get your phone out. And I need you to text the word family to the number on the screen. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I need you to help me walk in victory. I need you to help me walk in victory. This is not about membership. This is about walking side by side with each other. And I need to know who I can call on. I need to know who I can call because you and I both know it's, it's hard to walk in victory with Jesus Christ by yourself. You need the body of Christ. The two greatest gifts that God's given us is the body of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And we want to encourage you today to take the next step and let the body of Christ know I'm willing to walk. Amen. Hey, listen, guys, have a great Sunday. Have a great day. Hope to see the pickleball tournament. Hey, if you haven't bought a T-shirt yet, make sure you do that when you go out. They'll be gone really quick. All these wonderful colors. The band doesn't look like this on purpose. We made them wear T-shirts. See you next weekend.